Welcome to this edition of Coffee with Carl. We are changing our format a little bit as we indicated uh, last time. Uh, we were doing this live and forcing people to get up early in the morning and we don't want to do that to you anymore. So we are doing this from now on recorded, uh, but we will uh, in endeavor to drop it, so to speak, on uh, the first week of every month. We said Wednesday, hopefully it'll be Wednesday. But I'll definitely try for the first week of the month. And we started off with uh, talking about uh, Carl's background. And we kind of covered that. And so now we're going to move on to issues of the day. And before we start, I do want to plug one thing. You may, you may notice that um, I have uh, for I have boxes in the background. You can see the boxes, right? Boxes, boxes. These are boxes of blessing bags. The blessing bags are for our homeless count. Uh, so uh, our homeless count is going to be a little different this year. We're not using volunteers because of COVID. And we are going to have a kickoff, which we've not done before. And um, we want to make sure that you're aware of that kickoff. You can go on our homeless count on our page at uh, mdhadellas.org uh, and uh, if you go uh, on the homeless count page you can uh, click on a couple of links there and it'll take you to the blog and you'll see that our kickoff is on february 18th that's this month 2021 at 11 a.m and it's going to feature the mayor and uh, lots of other really cool and important people and also a short video from the field it's going to be streamed live on Vimeo, and we hope as many people as possible can join us. And there are sponsorships and there are blessing bags to prepare, which again is the reason for the boxes. So with that, I'm gonna, we're going to start here and uh, we are purposefully muting, muting ourselves when we're not talking. So the sound quality will be best. Um, and I'm just going to launch into my first question for Carl. So Carl, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Joe Biden took office as the 46th president and our homeless re rehousing system and specifically its backbone organization, MDHA, is largely federally funded. Uh, so how does the changeover in a new administration under a new political party uh, influence our work locally in uh, Dallas and Collin counties? I'm um, generally so I, I may be in the minority here, David, but ultimately um, what I've seen and I've been in this industry now for over 25 years um, and I've seen multiple uh, administrations, both uh, Republican and Democrat, um, sometimes, you know, both split, obviously. Um, Honestly, for the most part at the federal government, we've seen very little uh, change in what the federal government is doing in terms of funding or providing services or providing more support at the local level. Um, there have been some exceptions, um, of course, when uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, was passed, that certainly helped a significant number of people in those uh, in those states where they accepted or expanded Medicaid and and the Affordable Care Act um, was available to them, um, so that was an exception on the healthcare side for our population. But ultimately, most of the time for our population, it really really doesn't have a lot of effect. And and I think one of the biggest reasons is because. The Office of Housing and Urban Development, which is the funder that you mentioned before, which funds about 60% of what we do um, as the lead agency for our uh, homeless rehousing system. Um, the HUD has, uh, HUD has a bureaucracy there. I mean, they are in an office of the federal government. And so to make changes within that um, is really slow is really um, difficult um, and sometimes it's just it, it's just plain undoable to make changes that are really, really significant there. So for the most part, when when the president changes or even 
Uh, Congress changes a little bit from one party to another. Most of the time, there's not huge changes that we see within our homeless response system. And and the reason is because it pretty much, it, it revolves around funding and the funding really has not changed a whole lot over the years. Now, with that being said, um, there are some exceptions to that, uh, certainly during COVID, uh, where we could get some more relief funds and things like that, but uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So. Cool. Well, so that's very interesting. It's even uh, a counterintuitive, one might argue, particularly uh, uh, given the powers of what uh, Arthur, Arthur Schlesinger, I always have a tough time with that name, uh, referred to as the Imperial Presidency. Um, so now let's move backwards from Article 2 to Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, like Trump and Obama, uh, Biden comes into the White House with his party uh, fully capturing the legislative branch, uh, even, though, even though that means he might hardly see his vice president. Um, could new legislation affect our work in, uh, in helping end homelessness? And, and if so, how? Well, like I said, our, our day to day work from the federal government really probably won't be affected that much by it. Um, first of all, legislation often takes time uh, to change any of those things if they're already in place. So uh, the statutes, the legislation, the the um, CFRs that we have in place, the, the regulations that we have in place with HUD uh, typically won't change very much even when the administration changes. They, either the president often doesn't have time to do those kinds of things, or it's just gonna take so long that it literally could take their entire presidency for a statute or some kind of uh, legislation to change within HUD itself or within the HUD regulations. Now, again, like I, like I alluded to before, there might be some other special legislation um, as in the $1.9 trillion uh, COVID relief bill that is being or has been proposed by the president. Um, I saw today though, that there was a counter um, proposal given by some uh, Republicans, I believe in the house um, to that. And so of course there's some, you know, reconciliation that has to go on. Um, but let's say the 1.9 trillion was passed. Um, there is some uh, relief in that and there's some help in that. More specifically, some of the things, hold on, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Some of the things that um, are in there would be things like uh, $25 billion for emergency rental assistance, uh, $5 billion for other short-term um, rental assistance or other assistance for people um, trying to pay their rents, and then $5 billion for homeless services, which there really isn't, I haven't seen a whole lot that really clarifies exactly what that $5 billion would be. It's kind of a, it's kind of a catch-all, if you will. Um, it's more than likely from what I, from what people are saying, what I've heard is that it would be something similar to what we're doing right now with the Emergency Solutions Grant funding, which is funding rapid rehousing programs, uh, shelter programs, um, and things like that, street outreach programs, but it's very limited in the scope of what it can provide. Um, the other thing about the emergency solutions grant funding that's different is that it's typically used for one-time funds or funds that won't extend on beyond a year or two years. And so, some legislation like that that gets passed could have an effect on our on our continuums of care on our on our uh, homeless rehousing systems, and the reason is because we would braid that funding, as we like to say, with the other funding that we're already getting, and we would basically create a multiplier effect, which is what we're trying to do here in Dallas with some of our uh, Emergency Solutions Grant CARES Act funding that we've already received is we're trying to multiply the effect so we don't just house 100 people, but we house 500 people and really have that collective impact in the community that we're looking for. So 
legislation like that, something like that, um, typically, you know, those kinds of things are, are where we would see the biggest kind of change or, or bang for our buck with the new legislation. Now, we've heard something about universal vouchers, though. I mean, that could be a game changer, right? What, can, can you tell us a little bit more about that? It could be a game changer, but that's a pretty, that's a pretty big lift. I think um, that's, you know, um, almost like the universal basic income that Andrew Yang, the, the uh, presidential candidate brought up. Um, I think it's kind of along those same lines is uh, universal vouchers. You're absolutely right. Could in fact have an effect on our community, obviously, if they were to give vouchers out to everybody who needed housing, that would make it, uh, you know, at least in theory, it would make it easier um, for people to get into housing. But again, can you um, can you can you quickly explain what a universal housing voucher is? Because yeah, a, uni a universal housing voucher would basically just be a voucher that's available to anybody, particularly at a at an income level. Usually, is how they would set it. So they would say, if you are at this income level, then you're eligible for a universal voucher. Um, again, the difficulties with that in reality are you have to have the housing stock. Um, you can be walking around with a voucher, literally a paper voucher in your hand and, you know, not actually be able to use it anywhere. That would be the first problem. Second problem is sometimes it drives markets in the wrong direction. So you'll see in some markets where they have a lot of vouchers. Um, California is a good example of that. They have a lot of vouchers in California, but their housing market is is really, really high. So, um, so sometimes they have a hard time using those vouchers there because the market just continues to drive upwards with the more vouchers that come out into the community. Um, so sometimes it can drive the market in, in a different direction, and sometimes it doesn't really solve the problem. What I personally would rather see and what I think HUD should consider is prioritizing homeless individuals for the vouchers. Uh, right now, uh, vouchers are not prioritized necessarily for homeless individuals, but in our continuums of care, we prioritize people who are the most vulnerable for the longest term and uh, most intensive uh, forms of housing. So what I would rather see HUD do is put the same restrictions on the housing authorities um, or same guidelines, I should say, not necessarily restrictions, but same guidelines that they have to prioritize those vouchers for people who need it the most. Because um, right now, I think what you're getting is certainly people who need the vouchers. Don't get me wrong there. They're definitely people who need the vouchers that are getting them, but I'm not sure that it's the people who need it the most. Um, I can tell you that there are a lot of people in our emergency shelters and out on our streets right now who have no access to vouchers whatsoever. And to me, if we change that criteria, it would change for them particularly. Yeah, that's that that's that sounds like a better plan. Um, so 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 we talked about federal. Uh, and and as we as many people know, uh, our state legislature is engaging in something it rarely does, a legislative session, um, because they're not a full time legislature like uh, like Congress is. Uh, so, are there any bills uh, in going on in Austin that we should be keeping our eyes on in the homeless uh, rehousing system? Yeah, absolutely. We've been, uh, I have a couple of um, people that we have a legislative task force with the continuum of care that tries to keep track of some of the legislation, particularly at the state level while session is going on. Um, they've um, shared with me a couple of different uh, House bills that they've seen so far. Um, House Bill 1260 uh, is to try to create a pilot uh, or sorry, an evaluation of a data sharing network across the state of Texas um, for all of our homeless management information systems. So they're hoping that maybe we can get some evaluation done of that and kind of an analysis of what that looks like as we're um, putting together this data sharing network. That's one. Um, there are a couple of different bills that deal with what we call source of income. 
um, for homeless individuals. So sometimes homeless individuals will be discriminated against getting into housing based on their source of income. So if I am working with a housing program, um, a landlord may be able to discriminate against me based off of the fact that I'm working with a housing program and my income is not actually mine. You see this often when you look at um, places where people are renting and they'll say you have to earn three times the amount of rent in order to live there. Well, if you're in a housing program, even if you can pay the rent, sometimes you won't be accepted because you don't earn three times the amount of rent. And there are several and, and different- in Texas, they're allowed to outright say, right. we just don't take vouchers here. That's right, exactly. And so the source of income, um, some of that legislation I think is, is going to come together. Um, my understanding is there's a couple of different bills out there right now about source of, source of income. So they'll probably have to consolidate that a little or, or make it a little more um, tailored or specific for what they're really asking for. Um, the biggest one, though, I think that will probably have an effect or could have an effect is Medicaid expansion, is the expansion of Medicaid. And I know our very own um, Senator Nathan Johnson here in the Dallas area has uh, really kind of stepped up to talk about Medicaid expansion and try to um, push forward some legislation that would, in fact, allow for Medicaid expansion. I heard him talking the other day on a radio show and he was talking about how, you know, the Medicaid expansion is a 90 to 10 ratio where the federal government would pay for 90 percent of uh, the Medicaid services that individuals receive under the plan. And the state would only end up with 10 percent, which, of course, at a one with a one billion dollar shortfall in your budget, that might be a pretty good idea to be able to bring in 90 percent of those costs and free up the money that you are gonna use on healthcare on other things. So those are the big ones right now in the state legislature. Um, it's, um, it's still pretty early. My understanding is February 9th is when they'll reconvene, um, when they'll come back to the legislature. And at that point, uh, they'll have some committees um, already selected and, and chosen who the chairs are. And that's when the real work will kind of begin. But um, we're keeping our eye on it. And hopefully uh, anyone who tunes into this will, you know, subscribe to our newsletters and things like that at our uh, MDHA website so that they can be, um, they can keep abreast of any action alerts or any uh, housing bills that we see or uh, bills that deal with housing or, or homelessness, particularly. Cool. Yeah, there are not that many free lunches in life, but Medicaid expansion comes pretty close, so. Um, okay, so slowly, and, and slowly being the operative word, unfortunately, uh, folks are getting vaccinated, including frontline folks in our system. Uh, when can our homeless friends, whose studies have shown are three to four times more at risk of COVID, uh, expect uh, their vaccinations to take place? Right now, what we're hearing from most of our uh, medical professionals in the area is that they're waiting for a new vaccine to come out, um, which Johnson & Johnson is going through the test trials for. Um, I believe they're almost at the end of their test trials now. My understanding is even maybe the middle of February, it might be available in some areas or at least released um, to be available. Uh, the, the reason is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a one-dose vaccine. And so with our population of people, even in the shelters who are moving through the system and we're trying to get them rehoused as quickly as we can, oftentimes they're not in the same place for a long enough period of time to really make it uh, reasonable or accessible to them to have both doses. So even though they could go back to the same location, oftentimes they'll be moving around. It might be harder for them. Obviously, transportation becomes an issue. Um, scheduling becomes an issue. There's a lot of other things that are going on in their life, particularly as you're trying to get them housed, that are become issues for them to make two scheduled appointments three weeks apart. Um, so what we're really looking at is right now our healthcare professionals are telling us they're waiting for that Johnson & Johnson vaccine. As soon as that comes out, they would like to try to prioritize it for people who are homeless specifically um, because the regular housed population, if you will, 
um, can generally get the other vaccines. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to. We'll, those will be more readily available for the house population. But the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is really kind of what we're waiting on right now. At least that's that's the word lately. And again, could be middle of this month is what we're hearing in some cases that it could be available. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. You you kind of touched upon this it's something I don't think we often think about. Uh, is it's hard work to be homeless. <laughs> like you've got a lot of stuff on your plate. You got a lot of stuff that we don't have to deal with that they have to deal with. So if we can say, okay, show up at one appointment, not two appointments to us, it's just like, ah, big difference. Right. But for them, it really could, could, could make a huge difference. Um, okay. So from vaccinations to testing. So in our, Homeless Rehousing System newsletter, which which came out this morning, and no doubt everybody's read it already. Uh, we teased the story about how rapid testing is going to help our system um, eliminate barriers to shelter that have have plagued our system throughout the pandemic. And uh, we're we're pretty close to sharing the full story soon. But what can you tell us about about your role, uh, MDHA's role, but specifically your role uh, in this whole story? Well, really, what, what we tried to do was um, not only convene and collaborate with our partners, but really try and show the state in particular, um, the Texas Department of Housing and Consumer Affairs, I believe it's Consumer Affairs, um, that, uh, that we were working together as a continuum of care. Um, like you, uh, most people know, our continuum of care has uh, well over 85 agencies in it or provider agencies. And so what we did in particular is when our partners came to us with the opportunity to be able to get rapid test kits or rapid test kits, rapid testing done for our particularly unsheltered individuals to be able to help them access shelter faster and housing faster. What we did is we basically tried to put together that letter of support or that letter to the governor's office requesting that on behalf of all of the provider agencies, rather than sending it as one agency or two agencies, we said, you know, we're sending it on behalf of 85 plus agencies. And then trying to help make sure that we coordinate that among all the agencies and make sure all the players come to the table, you know, make sure we get all of the information out to everybody and everybody understands what's going on. Of course, we have our system transformation going on which also is helping us, um, you know, uh, get all that information together and bring all these people together. So they're kind of going hand in hand in that regard. And we're trying to run those work groups as well um, with all of the system transformation. But that was kind of our role is, again, the backbone agency supporting them and really trying to make sure that that when we made that ask, we made it on behalf of the entire continuum of care, not just one a uh, specific provider or two specific providers. There's lots of alphabet soup and agencies. Was it the Texas Department of Emergency Management or was it, I think that was it, right? If I'm yes, I'm say. sorry. Yep, you're right. Yep, sorry, I got my, my departments mixed up. It was the Texas Department of Emergency Management. Yes, TDAM, I think is what they call it. TDAM. TDAM. Yes, 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 Texas yes. Department. Lots of alphabet soup. Yes, yes. We have sorry. to all keep straight. That's right. Um, cool. So finally, we just got two items of really great news uh, in, in the recent days, a uh, week and a half, I suppose. Uh, we've got more CARES Act funding for our system, and our COC program funding uh, is coming through. Um, now, without getting too deep into the weeds, tell us about that. But as my boss, Nissi New, would say, uh, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. I'll try. I'll try and keep it as, as simple as possible. So uh, most, of, most of our listeners uh, are aware of the CARES Act funding. Um, CARES Act came down from the federal government. They gave it to us or they gave it to the state of Texas in the form of what we call emergency solutions grant funds. These funds can only f fund four different types of services, um, rapid rehousing, um, outreach, uh, 
shelter and HMIS services and prevention, sorry, five. Five different services. That's all that's eligible for these. The state went ahead and narrowed it down a little bit more and took out some of the other um, some of the other uh, eligible activities and basically left us with rapid rehousing, which is getting people into housing as quickly as possible, paying their rent and providing case management services to them for up to a year in this case. And prevention services, which is, of course, most of us can understand what prevention is. It's paying for, you know, uh, past due rent and uh, if you have eviction notices, things like that. So we just received a award. Uh, it was approved for $7.6 million for our continuum of care, Collin County, uh, uh, Dallas and Collin County. And we have 12 agencies, including MDHA, which are receiving $7.6 million. And over the course of the next year with this funding, our goal will be to house somewhere between 500 and 700 people in addition to what we're already doing within our system with this funding. So that's the that's the CARES Act funding that comes from TDHCA, the Texas Department, uh, Texas Department of Housing and Consumer Affairs. The second is our continuum of care funding. That's regular funding that we get uh, annually. Um, we usually receive it uh, right around Christmas time is usually when the award comes out. Uh, this year, they renewed it for us uh, without us having to go through, you normally have to go through a competition to apply for these dollars. This year, the legislature, because of COVID, did not have a competition and they just did an automatic renewal. And we will end up with about $18.5 million this year, which is the most that we've ever received in this area for housing programs. Now, typically these housing programs are a little longer than what we call permanent supportive housing. And they provide rental assistance and uh, case management and wraparound services to people. But these are for people who uh, have, some more, uh, have some more challenges in their life, some more barriers in their life and may need a little bit more support than normal, which means we might have to serve them longer than two or four years. We might have to serve them for quite a while um, in this type of housing. So we received eight, eight, like I said, $18.5 million, which I believe is somewhere around 26 projects um, in our continuum of care. And that money will start coming out. Um, it's actually renewal. So these programs are already in place. What this allows us to do is continue to keep people housed and continue to new, move in new people with these dollars. But that will continue going through September of 2022, actually, is when it will generally run. Does the COC program not include uh, both um, permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing? It does. The housing? COC, okay. yes, sorry. The COC does. Our continuum of care has used it primarily for permanent supportive housing, and the reason is because it's one of the only funding sources that will pay for permanent supportive housing. So uh, we do have a few rapid rehousing programs in there, but it's very few. Most of it is permanent supportive housing and rightfully so that's, that's where, uh, that's where we can get the biggest use for it or the best use for it. Cool. Well, Carl, we've covered quite a bit this time. Uh, so thank you. And I think this this worked uh, very well in the for this format. We're both sitting here in the afternoon. We didn't have to start this at 7:45 in the morning, and we didn't force anybody else to do the same. Uh, so thank you, Carl. And uh, we will uh, do this again, uh, same time, same bat signal. Is that what they say? Something like that next month. That's right. Same bat channel. Same bat. That's uh, it. Yeah. Same bat time. Same bat channel. I believe is how. Perfect. Thanks, so. Carl. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, thanks for listening to us. And um, if you need any more information, certainly visit our website at mdha.org. Um, mdha Dallas. Dot org. It's okay. By the time you hear three years, you'll probably get it straight. That's right, exactly. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Bye.